Peter Jordanson is a renegade intellectual and free thinker. His challenging viewpoints are not considered strictly welcome in some unenlightened regions. His appearance and voice have been obscured to protect his right to free expression and against self-incrimination. And also if we decide to use a different actor for the final version of this. The young man of today sits at a point of crisis and uncertainty. I say sits rather than stands, deliberately of course, because as a classical speaker of the Western tradition, I am not given to extrapolate my verbosity into extraneous or unnecessarily discordant elaborations. No, today's young man sits on his couch in his bed, perhaps on an oversized sack filled with beans and an obscene postmodern recontextualization of a chair. He sits in front of his television, his iPad, his Sony Xbox, even this YouTube channel. He sits sullen, directionless, time ticking away from his priceless, virile, spawning years, and the masculine life essence dissipating from his humors, and indeed from the universe itself and thus from us all. He, he sits because to sit is the inverse of to stand and our debased modernity has given him nothing to stand for. The civilizational tradition conceived by the vanguards of Western man-thought, Plato, Nietzsche, Jung, Chesterton, Hawks Summers, Durden, once promised the developing boy-child a societal compact. Step out bravely from the insidious maternal suffocations of the womb, the nursery, the apron strings, and, yes, even the supple, enriching irreplaceability of the nourishing breast. <clears throat> and take your claim of manhood, a career that will bring Ptolemic meaning to his life and platonic definition to his muscles, a social position befitting his command of the life-spreading phallus, women to receive his passions and gift him with children, unto whom he would pass great wisdom such as these very words. My words. Peter Jordanson's words. But today, that compact is debased and diluted, stripped of its proper omnipresence in our fallen and deranged so-called society, to dominating only a paltry 95% of the culture, derided as patriarchy, a word which, to my knowledge, simply didn't exist until 1972 or thereabouts, by a radicalized third-wave feminism that boasts of having superficially empowered women and girls, but has, in reality, mainly had the effect of leaving the Western boy-child neglected and lost, with no glories to seek, and thus no true transcendent manhood to strive for and attain. Of course, we know why they do this and who's behind it. It's not a secret. The forces of globalist neoliberal capitalism seeking to reduce the gonadular fortitude of a masculine worker, soldier, warrior, king as prescribed in the natural order as the poet said, men be working, women be shopping, the masculine as innate creator force, the feminine as innate consumer force, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, and reduce the vital male individualist to which Western civilization owes its prior unchallenged greatness to become himself an estrogen genocide, consumer cog, and the post-human machinery as well. This is why culture, quote-unquote, suddenly decides that women should also work outside the home amid the Rooseveltian Marxist chicanery of the 60s that conveniently raised income taxes to render the two-income household necessary, why the American, nay, Western hero G.I. Joe begins to use the androgyne kung fu grip of the scheming Oriental, why Madison Avenue and its Rothschild masters begin to condition babes to breakfast on pure produce, forsaking the embraceable welcome of the breast. We, we don't need to dwell into that, and you can hear me expand on these themes in my books and other lectures. The point, friends, the point is that this modern culture leaves the unformed boy child with nothing to stand for, to fight for, to, to claim. The politically correct nature of our decadent neoliberal late capitalist civilization no longer tells boys that they can grow up to be captains or ghostbusters or even recreational burglars, offering instead as role models so-called superheroes who cry, talk about their feelings, have issues, and pander to revisionist diversity fantasies, and, and then you wonder why they don't know how to behave, how to cope, why they lash out, you wonder why, you wonder why, and then you have the unmitigated, hysterical, fallopian gall to suggest that it's anything other than what I just explained to you, you degenerate harpy cows. <clears throat> Naturally, there is, I believe, a curative for this, and it comes from revisiting and deriving a new appreciation for the classics, the foundational oral traditions, not simply mythology or fairy tales, as they're so often mischaracterized, that shaped men's self-understanding in ages past, and indeed the Western masculine tradition itself, effectively comprising the creation stories of man-thought. And to my mind, there is no classic more essential to the development of a healthy male psyche, a balanced hyperliminal testosterone equilibrium, than he man and the masters of the universe. He man and the masters of the universe. 
He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, of course, as we all remember, or, or perhaps we don't. I imagine the cultural Marxist school system has this one on the chopping block right next to James Fenimore Cooper, Jack London, Carl May, Frank Miller, and all the other awful old white patriarchs they've got to clear out to make way for the next wave of globalist gender erasure propaganda, but I digress. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe originated in the golden age of animation, by which, of course, the classical thinker refers to the 1980s, the first truly free and individual cultural era of the medium thanks to the industry deregulation policies of America's last authentically masculine president, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Liberated from the vision-impeding shackles of having to include socially redeeming messages or environmental entreaties about friendship or some such, 1980s animators were free to create cartoons in the mold of classical, unfettered man-thought by adapting the intellectually pure mythic arcanum associated with the contemporary prepubescent morality totems of the time, the action figure. In the Masters of the Universe, or Motu, we find a classical pre-Christian heroic epic layered with elements of the Teutonic, Homeric, and Hyborian mythological canon, forming to my mind the most strikingly pure vision of the healthy masculine moral psychological being in conflict with his enemies, his world, and his own nature, en route to the destiny that drives him and indeed must drive all men, so, so that they might drive their respective societies to become the master of their own universe. Now, that sort of cleverly hidden symbolic meaning is all over He-Man. You don't need to acknowledge that it's there for it to take effect and influence your understanding. That's how it works. But those seeking richer understanding of their understanding can find it by, by applying the man-thought principles. You'll note that character names become important, as with the central character of He-Man. Now, the meaning here is subtle, but if you look more closely at the two words comprising that name long enough, your mind properly decluttered of pervasive neo-feminist brain clouding, the pattern should reveal itself. he Man. He. Man. He. Is a man. Here we are presented with a protagonist whose sense of self and identity are so fully formed that his name itself is the answer to the question of identity. Who is he? He is a man. And that's all he needs to be. Fundamentally, He-Man's story is itself a fascinating metaphor of the journey to manhood. In his secret identity as Prince Adam, He-Man is very much a boy child still, pale of skin, dressed in pinks and purples. His best friend is a coward of a cat named Cringer. Cringer, of course, a curious element of the broader symbolic puzzle in his own right. Is he the stuffed animal who must be replaced in manhood by the car or motorcycle, as Cringer himself is transmogrified into Battle Cat? Is he the childhood friend who holds back the upwardly mobile Adam? Is he the awful, un wanted cat, given to the boy child as a pathetically poor substitute for the dog he wanted, the dog he should have had because Miss Puss scratches and cats can't fetch and a boy should have a dog and it's not fair that I can't have one just because Kim is allergic and I don't even think that's true. I think you made it up because you don't want it digging up your flower beds and... <clears throat> But on discovering a magic sword within Castle Greyskull, there another more obvious illusion, a Grey Skull, here referring to the brain of an older man, i.e. Masters of the Universe, instructing its adherents on the virtue of seeking out the wisdom of their elder generation, Adam is able to transform into He-Man, an embodiment of the classical masculine physical ideal who so radiates male power that he is able to project his transformative energies onto Cringer, elevating his timid friend up to a proud and sturdy mount with a burst of symbolic testosterone Pastoral baptism from the tip of his mighty, piercing blade. These, these layers of subtextual symbolism are packed tightly into the rich cultural tapestry that was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Twisted tautly into the sinews of a meditative musculature, observe the near-identical physical bodies gifted to He-Man's allies, men otherwise as diverse as Fisto, Mechanek, Man-at-Arms, Mossman, Zodak, Snout Spout, Skyclone, so many others. Of course, the decadent elites of establishment academia will tell you this is some kind of flaw, a byproduct of cheap animation or reused toy molds, the despicable schools of postmodernism propagandize that ideals are unattainable in order to discover the masculine virtue of achievement and uplift the feminine virtue of contentment and modernity. But the classical thinker can see this supposed uniformity of the male figure as nothing less than a deliberate commitment to the philosophy of the platonic idealism and the golden ratio, the outlook that told young men not to settle for the pitiable adequacy of the attainable, but to strive for the swollen, prideful, throbbing heights of Olympian perfection, or rather, Eternian, perhaps. Naturally, the symbolism is spread in other, more complex ways to the villain of our piece, Skeletor, who is possessed of a muscled physique near identical to He-Man's save for his incongruously skeletal face. More laziness or budget constraints, I ask you? No, by now you know better than that. 
one must look deeper into the text, or rather into my look deeper into the text on your behalf. Note the use of mixed metaphor in Skeletor's home base at Snake Mountain, snakes representing the phallic masculine, but also the corrupting influence of knowledge in the biblical betrayal of Adam by Eve narrative. From this we might gather that Skeletor's story has wisdom of its own to impart, but that it must be received carefully, not in the wide-open free-for-all of self-education or the neoliberal regressive feminist indoctrination swamp of the so-called classroom, but perhaps here in the safe, unbiased space of a one-sided, quasi-conversational lecture from a verbose older stranger on YouTube. Now, the most obvious lesson is clear. Skeletor is the fearsome of face and wicked of disposition, yet makes a partner of the alluring Eva Lynn and easy but welcome visualization, the sway that physical power and material wealth, peacocking if you like, will always hold in drawing the uncomplicated affections of the feminine subspecies, but the greater truth is found in Skeletor's origin as detailed in the long-form epic He-Man and She-Ra, Secret of the Sword wherein we learn he began as a member of the powerful evil Horde space syndicate, left behind on Eternia after one error during a mission alongside Hordak to abduct the royal twins in their infancy. Beaten but not defeated, he establishes a new seat of power in Snake Mountain and gathers his own army of Eternia's own monsters and minions to rise anew, an evil overlord in his own right, like Lucifer learning to reign in Hell, or Loki cast from Asgard, Scar as king among the hyenas, or even the archetypal renegade intellectual forced from professorship in the halls of academic tenure by the smug liberals, arrogant postmodernists, and small-minded disciplinary committees, forced to build a new name for himself in the fetid yet surprisingly fertile realm of internet video, gathering to him a following of lost and disaffected youth so easily susceptible to the faintest approval of a vaguely paternal voice, so eager for validation and direction, so capable of wreaking petty havoc on his behalf that... <coughs> These mischaracterizations of the presence of the neoclassical movement and platonic ideal in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe by pernicious postmodernists are, of course, ex extended even more greatly to the women of the saga. Feminized social justice academia will point you to these images of Eva Lynn, Tila, the sorceress, Queen Marlena, She-Ra, and tell you that, that this is the same basic drawing, differently painted, and hold up as counterexample the currently en vogue amorphous genderless blobs encouraged by students of the Cal Art School philosophy and seemingly at work in crafting the She-Ra reboot, wherein one cannot even tell if the heroine remains a woman at all. I, I mean, honestly, does this look like a girl to you? Well, did you have an erection right now? Because I don't, and, and how else would I otherwise make such a determination, I ask you? <clears throat> now, a classical thinker, steeped in man-thought and armed with the neo-Socratic method, understands that this is merely another symbolic layer of meaning. Here, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe imparts to the developing boy-child the key understanding of the female that the neoliberal Marxist relativism has left fathers no longer qualified to impart that there is, in truth, only the one woman, that is, only one uncomplicated, universal, feminine psyche that plays at complexity by way of contradiction, and that once the boy-child comprehends this feminine singularism, he can assert his dominion upon them, and that they, in turn, might recognize the validity of the supplication that is their nature, desire, and proper social role, the role they long to return to, as do we all, regardless of how much contemporary propaganda is produced at convincing them they don't need no man, or apparently even proper sentence structure. The modern female wears the mask of detail and obfuscation, but whether in the form of the enticing yet duplicitous colleague, the enticing yet duplicitous rival, the enticing yet duplicitous female boss, the enticing yet duplicitous sibling, or the enticing yet duplicitous mother, recognizing that to knowing how to handle one is to handle all is among the most important lessons we fail to teach our young men, and ironically in doing so we rob all these women of the suitable partners they require. We return to the visage of He-Man's alter ego, Prince Adam, where, once again, the mythic illusion is quite clear. Adam indicating the Edenic Ur-Man, the original male, Prince denoting noble destiny, but one not yet fully formed. To the viewer, that is, the receiver of the myth, it is obvious that the meek and civilized Prince Adam and the free and virile He-Man are one and the same. They have the same hair, the same face, the same body. Only a tan and an octave or two in vocal range separates them, and yet all but his closest male friends are utterly blind to this, unable to see the true man, the master of the universe, beneath the camouflaging feminization of his societally imposed princely station, which claims to elevate his status, yet castrates him of his stature. And do you not see? Is this not how all young men now feel, whether they've had their self-awareness actualized in Socratic man-thought or been red-pilled, as the young ones say? Do they not know 
within their man hearts that they are he men whom postmodern neoliberalism and feminist cultural Marxism have conditioned those around them to perceive only as atoms, and what must be understood, what the deep and profound symbolic textures of the masters of the universe mythos seeks to impart to the lost and wandering boy child of modernity is that only by seeking out the wisdom of the gray skulls, of those so called dead white males whose once unassailable knowledge has been shunned away by progressive academia, shedding the false trappings of neoliberal corporatized feminist calls status and instead bearing his true, tanned, masculine, grown self in, in contemporary real-life terms by cleaning one's room, straightening one's posture, rediscovering the hat and the jacket, pulling up your damn pants, it's all in my books, and taking firm, masculine hold of his own mighty, potent sword of power, aiming the rigid instrument erect to heaven in bold declaration that by the power of those cast-out gray skulls, he has the power, and he is a man and that from that boldly spoken truth can spring the empowerment of friends, the acquiescence of enemies, and above all else, the supplication of the enlightened female in all her forms, be she the no longer proud supervisor, the no longer haughty temptress, the at last appreciative quote-unquote friend, even the once so dominant matriarch or disrespectful sibling, regardless of what bourgeois puritanism has to say on the matter. They bend to him, in whatever sense that might mean to him, be it join my cause, fight at my side, receive the gift of my seed, clean my room, make me a sandwich, because he has claimed his truth and become the master of his universe. Now then, some of you no doubt disagree with this. You may find my words too much to handle, controversial, politically incorrect, incomprehensible, or stupid, you may be saying to yourself that this brief but profound plunge into man-thought was too much for you to take in at once, or self-indulgent, or in one of the most ignorant things you've ever heard. My words may have challenged you, awakened you, provoked you, offended your delicate sensibilities, perhaps even caused you to ask, is this a joke? Is there something wrong with him? Or, no, but really, is this a joke? Because this really sounds like it would have to be a parody of something. Hmm. Well, you may call me politically incorrect, or a charlatan, a misogynist, a chauvinist, a bigot, patriarchal, a backwards paternalistic Neanderthal, or, or even a joke. You can even say that I am not only frighteningly ignorant of the subjects I pontificate on, but the ideas I'm spreading are filling the minds of a generation of impressionable boys and young men with ugliness, hate, and a profoundly dangerous rejection of self-reflection, radicalizing them to a toxic worldview likely to leave them stunted, emotionally withdrawn, seething, and unexamined resentments that are a magnet to even more poisonous ideologies, and a breeding ground for self-harm, abuse rationalization, and sexual violence. But what I can promise you is that whatever you think of what I've said here, it's nothing too dissimilar from what's being said by dozens of other men like me on dozens of other channels, being watched for hundreds of hours a week by thousands of otherwise very normal-seeming, otherwise very quiet and unassuming young men on YouTube every single day. Perhaps young men in your own life, in your own social circles, your own family, your own home. And if that worries you, maybe... Someone should talk to them about these ideas before someone like me does. I'm Peter Jordanson, and you have now received a selection of my man thoughts. You're welcome.